I'm Marshall Kozloff, and this is Arsenal of Democracy. Never before has our American civilization been in such danger as now. Danger against which we must prepare. But we well know that we cannot escape danger by crawling into bed and pulling the covers over our heads. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. As you can see from our background here, me and the team flew out to Simi Valley, California, the Reagan Presidential Library, to record a bunch of podcasts with folks at the Reagan Defense Forum. We spoke with CEOs, venture capitalists, and policymakers as we worked to confront and answer the big question of 2024, can the United States maintain the deterrence that is so a part of President Reagan's legacy? Hope you all enjoy these conversations. Nadia Shadlow, welcome back to Arsenal Democracy, this time from uh, Simi Valley, California, for the Reagan National Defense Forum. Thanks so much, Marshall. It's, a, it's great to be here with you, uh, great to be here with a whole bunch of the Hudson team, um, and it's a beautiful setting. Yeah, this is an incredibly straightforward episode. We're doing a bunch of recordings today. I just wanted to come together for one of my Hudson colleagues, kind of just set the table for both the event, but also the past year and the year to come. So I guess the first question would be, what is top of mind for you? I know for me, um, because it's the Reagan Forum, we're thinking about deterrence. That's a critical topic for this moment. What's What are you thinking about in this moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking about how messy the world is <laughs> and how you restore deterrence within within that mess. Um, you know, we're seeing this huge reordering of, of the world today um, or, you know, a realignment, which which I really like that term. It happens to also be the name of your other great podcast. Um, but it's th- these realignments are, are happening and in play. And on the threatening side, we're seeing Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, all colluding fundamentally against U.S. interests. And they have the capabilities as well to back up their determination to drive sort of this disruption. You know, we just saw, for instance, North Korea provided Russia with over a million shells. Um, the government just reported about a thousand containers have been delivered to Russia. I'm not sure what's in those containers. Probably not, you know, stuffed animals or or, or matchbox cars, <laughs> right? So we're actually. Uh, seeing these shifts go on, as well as kind of big techno-industrial shifts, uh, large language models and AI, energy, biotech, synthetics, all of these changes will stress our institutions and organizations. So that's sort of what worries me, because government is not great at that catch-up, that organizational change. Um, And so I I am a bit worried about all of that. Uh, I'd love for you to unpack the term messy a little more because it's both precise, but it's also imprecise. So I think of the word and yeah, messy comes to mind, but there have been the 1990s were messy in some respects. The 2000s were obviously messy. What is it that's unique about the challenges we face right now? Right. I think that's a great question. I think it's, it's managing challenges uh, with a relative decline in American power with a lot of dissension at home about the role we should play in the world. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Uh, so I think the, those are two fundamental differences, but also three. I mean, as I mentioned, we're seeing the type of collusion among uh, these adversarial actors uh, that I don't think we saw uh, before in concert, right? They're really acting in concert. Uh, we're seeing now China's deliberately making, uh, while it could be playing perhaps, uh, well, it definitely could be playing a more constructive role in the Middle East. It's chosen not to even call out Hamas for their terrorist attacks on October 7th, right? Uh, that would be an easy thing for the CCP to do. It hasn't done it, right? It's it's driving disorder. Um, so I think that's that's fundamentally different. We're seeing that that collusion among these powers in a different way, relative decline uh, in U.S. leadership and U.S. capabilities to a certain degree, um, and in sort of the the level of dispense spending um, and the kind of military we need, which is what this conference is about. Something I'm curious about when you talk about the decline in American capability and leadership, how much of that is just an inevitable reality of 
globalization and the road shifting versus active policy choices. So, for example, we could have maintained our defense industrial base for the past 30 years, and instead it was left to really struggle. That has nothing to do with anything being inevitable. So what's the balance between inevitability and active choices we're making? I mean, it's hard to put a percentage on it, but I think it's, I think it's both. I think your example is a great one. We had, uh, we weren't really giving thought to our defense industrial base. We were writing about it and experts were writing about it. And even the defense department was recognizing weaknesses. I recently did a short paper, um, on looking at report, looking at essentially about 15 years of the defense department's industrial base reporting. And if you go back and look for 15 years, we've been saying the same thing for about that long. That's fascinating. So, kind of, the discourse treats it as this came out of nowhere. No. I mean, actually, weaknesses, um, understanding you know, weaknesses in, in different parts of that um, defense industrial base, uh, there have been warnings of it for years and years and years. So we're, we ha- we, we're just not fixing it. Now, today, there's an urgency brought on by Ukraine, brought on by Israel uh, in terms of um, what we need to do to help to support our allies. So there's the urgency there. But as I started, the problem is our organizations remain very stubbornly, <laughs> very stubborn. It's very difficult to act with agility and adapt. I mean, just today, I uh, just heard um, Commerce Secretary Raimondo talk about um, one of her most important entities. Uh, BIS, which stands for the Bureau of in, uh, Industrial Security. I think I need to check on that. BIS, it's the, it's the bureau that Alan um, Estevez ha- heads. It has the same budget budget um, as it did a decade ago, basically, $200 million. Yet this is the bureau that is supposed to be designing the entire and implementing export control regime. Um, that we're implementing today. Towards so, China. So toward China. a gargantuan like, 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 task. A garg- gargantuan task. Very complicated. Yeah. It's basically staffed at the same levels it was a, de- a decade ago. I mean, they're, they're trying to increase the staffing level and the budget as well, which she, she sort of called out Congress. There are lots of members of Congress in the audience to say, hey, I need more funding to do this job that you've given me. Um, look, and I'm not really sympathetic to growing government, but it doesn't make sense to provide, you know, billions in dollars in CHIPS Act funding without the corresponding infrastructure you need to do a good job at actually implementing it. So those are the kinds of disconnects um, that I think uh, will be a problem. One could say then organizations like DOD are failing to make the adjustments they need to make when it comes to the defense industrial base. But as you just articulated, it's not just that these organizations are working on their own. There's a broader ecosystem. There's Congress. There's the executive branch, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How should members of Congress conceptualize that we're not just in an adversarial situations with these other institutions, but we actually have to work together to do things? I mean, I think Congress, when it appropriates and authorizes funding, needs to give thought to how um, how the actual implementation will unfold. They need to give thought to that, Im- the implementing mechanisms, and to hold those mechanisms accountable. Uh, a, a should be a sense of how are we going to make these changes. Even if, it, even if um, Commerce Department's budget is increased and BIS's budget is increased, Congress needs to pay attention to how it's going about implementing. We need more transparency. It needs to demand more transparency of, um, of our agencies. I actually have a piece out this week in National Review, which tries to address how conservatives can think about industrial policy um, in, a, in a way that makes it less bad, right? No one, I mean, I don't want bigger government. I think government is, is very clunky, right? Not efficient. Uh, so given that and given the need um, for industrial policy in key areas, what what should we do? How do we think about it? And one one suggestion is demand transparency. I'd like to know as a taxpayer, but also as a national security person, where is the thirty nine billion going? How is it being spent? It should be easy to find that information out. And right now, things are set up so that it's not. I just want to call out our previous conversation, which this concept you introduced to me was just so helpful. Um, you pointed out that a critical failure we have when it comes to these big categories is we kind of treat the appropriation of money as the win in of itself. Right. So we passed the CHIPS Act, therefore semiconductor independence. But that's just not true. So can you just <laughs> reiterate? Because it was just such a helpful – I mean this seriously. Ever since you made that point, it's a straightforward one, but it's also like a really smart one. I've just seen, oh, wow, all we're doing is touting 
appropriations, but that's the same thing at all. Right. And if and if you watch the language in the media and the language used by policy officials, um, it's I mean, you're exactly right. You'll see it as the passage. You'll see it as a given that the outcomes are already here. They're not here yet. So it's up to us to figure out how to actually get to the outcome so that a year from now we'll be able to say, oh, Marshall, actually that fab facility, you know, ground has broken and we're starting to build and we have the STEM people that can be employed there. Um, so that's the sort of conversation that we want to be having in a year from now. But it shouldn't take hours to sort of figure out where the money is going, what's happening, where is groundbreaking, what are the expectations for the particular grant. All of that is really important. Not to play gotcha, not to be critical for the sake of being critical, but because if we're going to spend the money, we need to see um, the, the, the outcomes. We need to see the implementation as well. Um, otherwise, it's a waste of money and we don't get the national security benefits. So that's where, you know, Hudson um, can come in and thinking through, one, how do you create what, what would make sense organizationally to help DOD and commerce and other entities, you know, drive toward that transparency? Yeah, and it's so interesting because I just did a recording with uh, Joe, the founder of Ursa Major Rocket Propellant Companies, coming on um, this podcast, of course. And I was just thinking, to your point about, you know, the appropriation of tens of billions of dollars isn't enough. This is like him saying, we've raised hundreds of millions of dollars to do rockets and everyone's just cheering. No, the expectation is you're able to translate that funding into an actual like accomplishment. So I guess the question that for you- But he'll be able to do it. Like we'll be able to look in a few months within a year and we'll see actually. So I guess the question then is, I'm really glad you're writing that piece for National Review because conservatives need to do serious thinking about industrial policy. What are just the categories- where conservatives, because times have changed, to your point, so we, we live in a messy world, we live in the post-COVID supply chain crunch world, where are the categories where a conservative new to the industrial policy topic should realize, okay, this isn't purely about creating jobs, this isn't purely about making labor unions happy, we just actually need to do this, and the, and the market in the year 2023 is just not going to deliver it. Right, well, the piece is out, and so it, it It does exactly that or tries to, to explain how we got here. And fundamentally, the playing field just is not level. The private sector hasn't delivered enough on these national security tech outcomes in terms of, um, in terms of, for instance, we don't produce leading edge chips, right? They're all produced in Taiwan. You need those types of microchips to, to, um, so that our all of, virtually all of our weapon systems can function. So they're directly related to deterrence, right? If we had no microchips, we couldn't build, we couldn't upgrade. It would have a big impact. Um, so that's how we got here. Now, what we need to look for is, as I mentioned, transparency in how the money is being spent. Second, don't add in externalities. It's hard enough to do AI. It's hard enough to do what Joe at at Ursa Major is trying to do, quantum. So don't add in externalities such as you also need to uh, be cutting edge on environmental issues. You also need to be cutting edge in the way... uh, all of these externalities that don't have to do with the actual mission of the company. Yet we're doing that, right? If you look at, look, uh, if you look at the specifications for a lot of these grants, they require companies to do all these other domestic policy externalities independent of their mission. So those are some areas. Three, let the states be competitive with, with each other, right? A key part of um, that, that conservative approach is entrepreneurialism, competition. Let the states compete. That's good. That's a good thing so that they can attract business, create and uh, work with incentives, tax incentives, reduce regu- the regulatory environment. Yeah. So um, something I'm curious about, you mentioned technology. Um, I'd love for you before I go into like, the near last question I'm asking to every guest. Um, you mentioned LLMs, AI. This is sort of like the word, the category of the moment. What is your guidance for Hudson listeners and viewers for thinking about this category moving into next year? That's a hard one. I think just learn, you you know, we all need to learn as much as possible. I'm probably more of a skeptic, meaning just worried. I'm more worried about it. I know there are optimists out there. I'm, I'm more 
worried about it. I'm worried about the impacts on jobs. I'm worried about uh, the impact on, um, because it moves so fast, that problem I mentioned early on, the ability of organizations and humans to keep up. I'm, I'm a bit worried about that, but I'm just continuing to learn. Uh, to have an open mind so that it's not just negativity. I'm approaching it also understanding the positives in the medical domain, for instance. There are huge positive healthcare impl- implications. But then I kind of flip and worry about um, <laughs> the, the military technical implications too, right? Of, of I'm, I don't, um, I think it's going to be very, very hard to prevent bad actors from gaining access to the technology as well. I know that's a hope of where government is. Um, that's also something that the Commerce Secretary did talk about. Um, how do we advance AI, she said, and control AI to win? I think it's very hard. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to control AI. But I'm lear- trying to learn. Yeah, and so the question I'm asking every guest, we're going to make this a tradition now today, um, is there's this really awkward dichotomy when it comes to the tech and national security conversations. So on the one hand, I'm urged to ask you about AI and people are thinking about drones and is the aircraft carrier over, you know, obsolete, hypersonics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When if we look to what's happening in Ukraine, it, a big problem is that we can't produce singers circa 1985. Um, the defense industrial base has worn down from its peak in the 80s and the 1990s. So how do you just personally think through the fact that in a messy world, we have to worry about this like future that in many ways is here, but at the same time, we have these very 20th century problems that we haven't quite solved or have kind of regressed in many ways? Well, that's one area where the technology can help us solve you know, a lot of these problems. I- AI and advanced manufacturing can help us to upgrade these factories, to create different kinds of factories that can produce at speed, at scale, much faster. But we need to do that. That's where the private sector can come in. Uh, That's where uh, DOD has had some very interesting ideas about munitions campuses, where the government provides the capital intensive infrastructure so that smaller companies can come in and test their, uh, test their products, you know, uh, to develop new energetic materials, uh, which power munitions, for instance, the chemical compounds you need, you need places to test those. So um, there are opportunities for AI and advanced manufacturing uh, and technology to drive changes in our industrial base. Uh, That's an area of work I'm going to be starting, an area of work uh, that also uh, some of my defense colleagues like Brian Clark will be working on and Dan Pat. So uh, those are good examples of positive ways that technology can help to upgrade uh, the, you know, America and what we need to do. So last but not least, from a questions perspective, like I said at the start, industry here, industry is here, Tech is here. Um, you and I are coming, policymakers are here. You and I are coming from the think tank um, perspective. Um, I guess I'm feeling a bit of, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, fear of missing out when it comes to the people who are like implementing and building um, in these spaces, given the challenges we're describing. Like, where do think tanks really come in? Like, the work that you're doing, the work that our colleagues are doing, how are they filling gaps that need to be filled in these spaces? Well, you can't do or you shouldn't do without thinking. Because first, we can. Right? We very much right? can yeah, and we will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what we should what we should be doing and what we are doing, and I think the rationale for a think tank uh, is to think about the problems, uh, accurately identify them, um, do the analysis uh, to address. Most problems are not solved in one way, right? They're competing ways to look at solutions and think tanks uh, are part of their job is to develop, uh, look at these competing options for solving a particular problem or making progress on a particular problem. That's where a think tank like Hudson comes in so that policymakers, when they get into office, don't have to do all of that background work. Most of them can't do it. You just don't have the time. You don't have the resources. uh, And you can provide them with options, which is what we're doing to say, hey, here are some operational concepts you might want to try um, in the South China Sea. Hey, here are some new approaches to uh, advanced manufacturing that you might be aware of, uh, looking at what the private sector is doing, looking at what companies uh, in the private sector are doing. So that's the role that we can play. But I've never liked the term do tank because my rejoinder is always, well, you actually want to be thinking before you're doing. As we made very clear, Nadia, thank you so much for joining on Arsenal of Democracy. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe below so you don't miss any episodes of Arsenal of Democracy. 
If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered on this episode or just are interested in broader content on U.S. foreign and domestic policy, be sure to go to Hudson.org. See you soon.